The starting point for preaching in Lent is to keep in mind what the Church has asked for preaching on any Sunday, whether Advent or ordinary time, Lent or Easter, and that is that the preacher always focuses primarily on the liturgical texts and the scriptures, the lectionary texts of that particular Mass, speaks in a conversational way, embeds it in liturgy, and is prophetic, connects it to the life of the people, to their needs, to their questions, to the particular situation in front of them. But in addition to that, Lent is a very particular time, and so the preaching in Lent also takes on its own particularity. The homiletic directory gives us some very good advice on how to preach in Lent, and the Church has put together a section in the directory specifically addressed to how a preacher might strategize, might prepare, might think about putting together his homilies for Lent. In particular, it reminds us that it is a season, and that being a season, there is a whole seasonal approach to the preaching. That is, that all of the preaching is linked from the very through, throughout the various Sundays of Lent. And so one Sunday can look back to the previous Sunday, this Sunday looks forward to the, to the next Sunday, and so on. And it's always done in the context of a general movement, a movement from a season of preparation Lent to a season of fulfillment, Easter, from a season of, of darkness to a season of light, to a, from a season of waiting to a season of the fulfillment of that waiting. So the homiletic directory says about this, it is important to underscore the sacramental reality of the entire Lenten season. So we put it firmly in its liturgical setting as a season, connected to what is happening right now and what it is preparing for, and that there is an arc in the preaching that takes us through the various Sundays and is going to lead us into Holy Week and then into Easter. That means that the preaching in Lent has a very strong opportunity to preach what the Church likes to call liturgically. And that means to make great use of the liturgical texts, the collect, the antiphon, the prefaces of Lent are particularly powerful and particularly beautiful, to highlight those liturgical texts, which is incorporating the homily now into the knitting it into the development of that particular liturgy, as well as the standard uh, parts of the Mass, whether it might be the confidior, relating that in, highlighting that, bringing that in to your homily, because this is, after all, a season of penance, we're leading up to confession, and so on. So bringing in the confidior, bringing in the prayer before communion, Lord, I am not worthy, um, to making reference to how this liturgy is different from the regular liturgies in ordinary time. Certainly the color is different, but also that we don't hear an alleluia. Why don't we hear an alleluia? We are preparing for an alleluia. Why we don't have a gloria? Why don't we have a gloria? How are we preparing to finally say that gloria? We don't have purely instrumental music. Why is that, why is that the case? What is, what is going on in this season of preparation for the great fulfillment? So there are all of these liturgical connections that can be made, drawn directly from this Mass and drawn directly from the, the whole season uh, and the flow of the season as a whole. Then the preacher looks at the particular uh, lectionary texts which are being used, and these also bring the preacher to a kind of trajectory for, uh, for his for his uh, preaching. That is, it, the church has put in themes which connect from one Sunday to another. So, for example, in the first Sunday of Lent, although each year A, B, and C uses a different gospel, all of the gospels are on the temptation of Christ, the of the temptation in the, de the temptation of Jesus in the desert, uh, Satan tempting Jesus. Then, in the second Sunday of Lent, 
different readings are being used in the different years, but they're all on the transfiguration. So what's happening is that the church is taking us from darkness, temptation, to transfiguration, to glory, which is now already in just the first two weeks as a, a, a miniature uh, view of the entire arc of Lent going through Easter, that this time of preparation, the time of testing, the time of trial gives way to a time of glory, gives time to a way of joy. And so that when the preacher is preaching, he can make that clear in the homily itself, when it's the Feast of Transfiguration referring back to what we had just experienced, or when we're preaching about the temptation in the desert, pointing forward to what this is all leading to, to what this is all for. At the same time, the first readings, which we know are paired to the gospel readings, also have a program through the different three years to take the listener through the whole history, the whole uh, gamut of salvation history. So, for example, in, in uh, uh, year A, in week one, we hear in the first reading about Adam. And then we hear in year B, we hear about Noah. And in year C, we hear about Abraham. And we begin to hear these, these, these great uh, figures in salvation history. And the idea of covenant now begins to come up with the covenant that, that God makes with Abraham, the covenant that God makes with Noah, the covenant that God makes with Moses, uh, um, uh, certainly Abraham, that these covenants are, uh, are all leading and prefiguring to the great covenant that comes with Jesus. Uh, there is sacrifice uh, in um, um, the story of uh, Abraham, there's sacrifice in the, in the event of Moses, and then there is the sacrifice on the cross, which is the seal of another covenant uh, for us. So that all can be linked together. Father Garrick Devona, who has written an excellent uh, um, book uh, on um, the seven-step ladder of preaching, Revitalizing One's Parish, speaks about the need in preaching to reconnect the listeners with the meta narrative. He makes the point that a lot of people are not really clear or, or do not have, or have never had the explicit links um, between the different uh, events in the Old Testament uh, made clear with, with what the New Testament is all about and how they link together and how it's one grand story and it's one grand story of our salvation. In that regard, when the preacher begins to focus on the overarching theme, let's say we're starting in week one and in week two, this theme from darkness to light or from from waiting to fulfillment, and is then is beginning to also bring in, you know, how we're awaiting the, the time of waiting uh, from the time of uh, Adam and, 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 and the time of, of Noah and Noah's waiting leading to the um, uh, to the fulfillment and the rainbow and the, and the new life or Moses leading us across the Red Sea and into the promised land or Abraham uh, uh, be, uh, being led into, into a new land and, made, and given a great promise. That while these things are happening and while the preacher is making that connection of the meta narrative and focusing on what the gospels are, are telling us and leading us to in these particular weeks, the preacher then also has a great opportunity to use the second reading. Because in normal time, uh, ordinary time, the second reading, the epistle, is Lectio Continuo, and it's not been particularly selected to pair with the first reading or with the gospel. Even so, the homiletic directory tells us that the preacher really should make an effort in ordinary time to look at what that second reading, what the epistle has to say, and then he will often find that it is uh, part of this whole scheme of the scriptures being mutually revelatory, that it still opens up, even though not particularly selected, uh, opens up some meaning, some understanding, or, or helps answer some question that has come up in the either the first reading or the gospel. But in Lent, that second reading has been 
specifically chosen. That reading has been specifically put in to help develop that meta narrative and make this connection between the New Testament and the Old Testament. So in week one, when we are hearing about Adam in the first reading, well, in the second reading, in the letter to the Romans, we hear about the first Adam and the new Adam, and, and it, develops that, it develops that whole theology. Um, in year B, when we hear about Noah and, uh, <clears throat> and his ark, then in that same in the second reading, which comes from First uh, Peter, we hear about Noah and the ark and baptism and how that connects with us. Um, in year C, we hear about uh, Abraham and, and 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 God calling Abraham, and uh, and and, uh, and 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 making promises to him. Uh, and we hear about Moses and the calling to Moses. Well, in the second reading also from the book of Romans, we hear about calling on the name of the Lord, um, uh, uh, Jesus and the word in the desert and so on. So there, this theme of calling and response um, uh, plays through all of that. So we begin right from the very beginning in the first two weeks to begin to see that the preacher can preach about a process which is mirrored in the first two weeks, darkness to light, as the season into Easter, a connection with the meta narrative, with the uh, with the whole history of uh, salvation, and we are then able to call. We are called to make links with um, so many things that are that happen in the Old uh, Testament in the Jewish scriptures and in the um, uh, Christian scriptures. So. Uh, the um, Hebrews are in the desert for 40 years and Jesus is in the desert for 40 days. And there are different patterns, um, patterns that apply to us. Now, we are in our desert of 40 days. Why? Because we have strayed too. But God promises at the end of our 40 days uh, that he brings us into light, into, into the fulfillment of his promises. The next thing that the preacher can do uh, is to make very specific connections to the listener. So every week um, of land, when we have these different themes which are coming through the through the liturgical text and which are coming through the lectionary text, we have an event, we have a theme which speaks about salvation history, but then also speaks about something that can be applied to the daily direct life of the listener in the congregation. So if the first week in all three years is about the devil coming and tempting Jesus in the wilderness, well, we are too in 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 our wilderness, in our struggles with our in our daily life. Sometimes feeling separated from God, sometimes fighting with the different things that come into our lives. And in those times, Satan will come, and we will hear temptations, and we will get confused, and we will, especially in the age that we live in, we will hear well messages like the you know uh, doing penance and 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 mortification that's um, not being good to yourself we need to pamper ourselves more and encouraging us to rely on ourselves to be uh, self-centered rather than god-centered and we can speak about how that's exactly what happened in the temptation event in the first week of lent and how it happens to us and how the um, there is that promise from the, there is that promise in scripture that devil is going to come back at an opportune time and he comes in opportune times in our lives when we're particularly weak or confused or um, uh, in trouble. In that first week of Lent, we hear in that story, that event of the, of the, temp, uh, of the temptations in the desert, that all those things that Jesus is tempted to do, what Jesus does for us in God's way, in the way that God wants it does. So the devil asks Jesus to make bread. Well, Jesus does make bread for us uh, out of his own body. Uh, Jesus, uh, The devil offers the kingship of um, the world uh, to Jesus. Well, Jesus offers and invites us to become kings, co-heirs of the kingdom. Uh, the, the, um, the devil asks to see a display of power of the gods, angels protecting him, bearing up on his 
hands and feet. And God does send his guardian angels to us and his protection uh, over us. So we can make direct connections with what's happening in the meta narrative, in the particular event of the gospel, with the particular life of the listener throughout Lent. In the second week, if it's transfiguration, well, if Jesus is transfigured on the mountain and is is being of light and, and so on, well, we are also called to be transfigured and we are also pro called and promised uh, to, uh, to a glorified uh, body. And even right now, before the fulfillment of that, we are called to an inner transfiguration in preparation for that. So, now in the in week two and in the and transfiguration, we can also make these applications from the first readings to the listener as well. So, for example, in that second week, the first reading. Uh, from the uh, Jewish scripture is the uh, Abraham hears a call from God or Abram hears a call from God and immediately obeys. He goes out of his country to a place he doesn't know where he's going, but it's a promise of God. And um, Timothy in the second reading speaks about a holy calling to obey God and suffer for Christ. So this is now we are called to step out and we are being called into a new land and we are being called to obey Christ and perhaps sometimes uh, suffer for him. And if and uh, and that suffering might be just simply mortification of um, the things that we want to put in place of him. In year B, Abraham the first reading, Abraham is called to sacrifice his own uh, son. Uh, and uh, But then God steps in. The angel steps in and provides the sacrifice for him. And the second reading from Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans, de declares that nothing can separate us from the love of God and that God has declared us as his children, that he rescues us. So again, what happens in that first reading and what happens in the gospel and what happens in the, or what Paul is saying in that second reading also applies to us. In your C of that second year, there is, that first reading is Abram's cov uh, covenant and there's a sacrifice of animals. And now this is bringing up the covenant theme, which we've already mentioned, a covenant theme that we can, uh, when we mention Noah or Moses or Abraham, or Adam, uh, David, any of these people that we that that we emphasize that this God is always entering into a co uh, offering this covenantial uh, re uh, relationship with us and has now created the supreme covenantial relation with us in Easter and this is what we are preparing for and this is why we are remembering all of the previous um, covenants and in that year C. The second letter from the letter to the Philippians talk about talks about us being citizens of heaven, a citizenship in heaven, or if we don't take that citizenship in heaven, destruction. So it's our citizenship, our covenant. Uh, we have our part, which then connects with the uh, uh, with the uh, um, sacrifices that we make uh, throughout Lent. The next thing is that we then, as, as preachers, can look for some particular themes that emerge from the following week. So we've moved in week one from uh, temptation to transfiguration, uh, so darkness to light waiting to fulfillment. But in weeks uh, three, four, and five, we also have themes throughout all of the years, through A, B, and C, the, the theme is the same for each of the weeks. So in week, uh, so you have one theme of repentance, you have another theme of reconciliation, you have an, another theme of new life. So the uh, homiletic directory puts it this way. The underlying theme in these three Sundays, so they're speaking about Sundays three, four, and five, after the move from uh, the desert to transfiguration, is how faith can be nurtured continually, even in the face of sin, the Samaritan woman, in the face of ignorance, the blind man, and in the face of death, 
Lazarus. These are the deserts which we travel through in life and which we discover that we are not alone because God is with us. So again, the homiletic director is saying, look, these things are going to come up now with um, the Samaritan woman and Lazarus and the blind man. And these have to do with, with ignorance and fear of death and so on. And this applies directly to us. These are the things that we experience. And again, the same thing happens with the um, um, with the letters in this in the second reading, and uh, um, and the uh, and and the, and the, the the first readings that there is this reinforcement and connection, this mutual revelatory opening up of the scriptures. Having done all of that, having starting to stitch all of the different Sundays together, starting to show the main themes that come through, whether they be repentance or reconciliation or new life or moving darkness to light and so on, connecting them all specifically uh, and very, very uh, clearly uh, to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the liturgical texts, particularly, as I mentioned before, the, the prefaces and the antiphones. When we do all of that, and then we bring it down to a connection to the individual person. So the individual person sees his or her life in the meta narrative and in the particular events, whether it's about Abraham or whether it's about uh, um, the woman at the well or whatever it might be being described that week. Um, then the preacher can then interpret that this is the part of the, the prophetic mission of preaching into the specific way that the listener responds. The homiletic directory likes to speak of a, uh, the uh, uh, structure of a homily as being first part about Jesus in scripture, Old and New Testament, second part about Jesus in this liturgy. So here's all the liturgical references, uh, references to the Eucharist and so on. And then the last part, which is they do emphasize is meant to be a small uh, conclusion, but is the response that the listener has to this good news, to the, um, to the primary work of what Jesus has done. So one of the things that the um, uh, uh, preacher can do here is to try to make sense of the liturgical practices that we have. I mean, if there's been a paring down and a kind of a more serious quality in the Mass itself and a giving up of things like music and the glory and the Alleluia, and if people are being asked to give up things in their life to make some kind of sacrifices, why? How does that really help? How does that really prepare for Easter or prepare for the kingdom? And different things can be opened up here. It's an, an opening of grace and, and an opening of what things are really all about. That it's not a means, it's not trying to be mean or it's not trying to be pure, puritanical, but it's trying to uh, open up the listener to what it really means to thy will be done and similar liturgical connections. That we take our will out of things, that our, our, we take our choices out of things and open ourselves up to purely listening to, uh, to what God has to say and to living out what he has done uh, and what he's asking for us. In this regard too, it can put a, a, a various Latin, Latin practices of giving up something in its proper perspective. And one of the things in a, a time like this, like in a time of COVID, where the um, uh, the, the, the preacher can make reference to what's going around us and also speak about how it's good to mortify ourselves and to give up certain things. As particularly, we start with those things that we know that is, get us in the way of God and then give up some things um, which may be good in themselves, but so that we are training ourselves to say no in little things so that we can say no to big things. But at the same time, to realize that an even greater penitential practice might be to accept what God sends us as something even more penitential, more ten penitentially valuable than what we would choose for ourselves so that we are locked into our homes or that we can't do a lot of things that we would normally do right now. This is something that is beyond our control. How do we 
how do we react to that? Well, one of the ways is to embrace that as that this is thy will be done. This is something that you've put into my life. What now can we do with it? How do we make this something that reveals God's will and and helps perfect us for this uh, for the coming glory of, of Easter? And so we can then speak about a number of practical ways uh, at that point uh, in the homily. It might it, it, um, the the choice that the um, listener is can be asked to make if when it comes up to the voluntary things, would be to choose something that is not going to make his life miserable and actually take his mind off God all the time because he's already always thinking of what or what, or she's thinking of what they're missing. So they to, to not make it um, uh, a terrible burden, but simply to make it something which is a reminder. And it something that can provide a spiritual good by what you replace it with. So, for example, replacing some of the recreational reading or some of the recreational TV watching with reading or TV watching that actually puts you in greater uh, awareness, in greater touch with the meta narrative. So, reading and watching things about the um, these, uh, our salvation history, uh, 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 reading about uh, I, it can be scripture, it might be about scripture, it can be the uh, uh, um, uh, it might be watching a documentary about Abraham or so on. Something that really helps and helps to deepen our understanding that the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Jewish scriptures, the Christian scriptures are connected uh, into one story. It, would, it might be the removal of something in our life, which is perfectly fine, perfectly innocent. But by removing that, we've created a space for 10, mix, 10 extra minutes of prayer. Right. So we so that that we are um, emphasizing that this is a, that these actions are meant to bring about a spiritual good. We could be making um, recommendations of a wholehearted morning offering. Which uh, to the sacred heart that could be said every morning and provide the prayer itself. You know, oh my Jesus, through the immaculate heart of Mary, I offer you all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings in this day. Now, all my prayers, works, joys, and sufferings. This implies, this in, in, includes this embracing of God's will for us as what he has given to us for a penitential uh, practice rather than what we might um, choose for ourselves. And that might even include the frustration of not being able to get uh, to Mass um, very easily. The last thing that uh, the, the preacher can do uh, in preparing Lent uh, or homilies for Lent is when he's making these connections, referring ahead to one Sunday, back to one Sunday, when he's looking for the themes that are running from one Sunday to another, like the first to second Sunday, the darkness to light, um, uh, waiting to fulfillment, uh, or the meta narrative images which speak about covenants and so on. When he's weaving this into his homily, then to look for images that are going to stick, which make it very clear. Um, Pope Francis in Evangelic Gaudium uh, likes to speak about the importance of the image. He prefers that more than an example or a story or an illustration. Some single image, some picture, which remains in the mind and which, when you think of it, opens up the whole homily. So it might be something very simple, which is connected to everybody's daily life, but would make sense right away. Spring cleaning, house cleaning. So we do a house cleaning and we do an inner house cleaning, the, that inner room of our soul has to be cleaned out. We're doing uh, their television shows about decluttering. So what we're doing is an inner decluttering because we're trying to take away and throw out all the things that are just sitting there that are actually obstacles and take up the take up room, the room that God could be using to in, in, inhabit us in our heart. Could be another you know taking the dust off the mirror you know paul likes to speak of the glass darkly so maybe we take the the uh, to, to, to clear that glass so we can see very clearly there's all kinds of images uh that the preacher can use but finding a good image 
for the covenant, for penitential practice, for the movement from darkness to light, for the movement from uh, a, a waiting to the fulfillment of that waiting. Jesus liked to use uh, waiting for the bridegrooms and the, you know, the bridegroom arrives and all of these things. Finding an image that would fit for the congregation that's in front of the preacher can be a way to help bring together all these various themes to help link together all the liturgical texts, to help link together the lectionary texts of that particular day and provide them a unified seasonal approach to preaching in Lent. <laughs>